Um, so we should be discussing what was discussed in your breakout rooms. There was three points of inquiry on the table. What is his thesis or overall points? Um, what is he up to with his notion of the abyss as a metaphor? And finally, what questions did you have about the reading? Um, who wants to start us off? Can I start? Yeah, please. Um, well, the thesis that I had, well, uh, it was it was kind of confusing while reading. I'm not going to lie. A lot of the stuff I had to read over a couple times to even try to understand what he was saying. But what I mostly took is that pe the people from Africa who were taken are just stuck in a place like going even into the abyss. They're stuck in an abyss. They're in an in abyss of turmoil the abyss of the boat. It was talking about the boat and the ocean. But I think in that aspect, it can be taken quite literally that they were in the abyss. They were in the belly of the boat. They couldn't escape things. So okay. to be more clear, it was uh, just not being able to escape, being stuck in traumatic circumstances and having to go through them without knowing when it will change or if it was going to change. And I think tonight the uh, the unknowing becomes important as it relates to the abyss. Absolutely, thank you. Um, anybody else want to chime in or share? What is Gleason talking about? What is this poetic describing? What is he describing for us? It's very specified. Slavery. The enslavement experience, correct. The transatlantic slave experience, absolutely. Um, what are some of the questions you guys pose about the reading? No one had any questions? Everybody understood the reading? I had a question, actually. Um, it was... Hmm. So in the first paragraph in reading, it had said something along the lines of um, deported to the Americas. Mm -hmm. And my question was, why did the author word it that way? Like, uh, cause when I think of being deported, I think, you know, you're not from there, right. but when you're taking people that are lived like they from this place, I just thought there would be different wording to describe that. Did you notice, um, Tanaya, the, the little asterisk behind the Americas? No, I didn't. I need to go back and read. Yeah, so so one, that's a good, that's very attentive for you to sit, like, question, like, why? Out of all the things that you're going to use, deportation is interesting. It, it kind of um, effaces the atrocity of that uh, situation, right? But if you look, so he says, for the Africans who lived through the experience of deportation to the Americas, comma, then there's a, a like an asterisk, right? So that asterisk indicates to go towards the bottom of the page where there's another asterisk. And then he kind of lays out why he chooses to frame it in the way that he does. Um, are there any other questions? If not, I'll jump into my notes and they'll kind of um, explain a little bit more what um, the question that Tanaya is posing. All right, I'll jump into it then. So the text or the book is entitled um, Poetics of Relations. Um, the author is a brother by the name of Edward Glissant. He's from the, Mar the islands of Martinique. Actually, these are um, the image of that transatlantic transition from Africa to, to the islands. Um, the book was originally published in French. Um, and then Betsy Wayne came out, came behind him and produced the English translation. So I do want you to think about um, what Somme said about how every time some, something is translated from one culture to another, uh, an element of violence ensues. So with that being, keeping that in mind, we have to understand that there's some violence that took place towards our receiving this text in English, okay? Um, so I'm going to go right to the question that Tanaya is posing. Hold on a second, let me find that shit. All right. So he states, for the Africans who lived through the experience of deportation to the Americas, comma, asterisk, confronting the unknown with neither preparation nor challenge was no, sorry, was no doubt petrifying. So 
if you follow that asterisk to the bottom of the page, so you see, I don't know if y'all can see this, but you see the asterisk. And then that asterisk is also reflected here, right? So that's a, a end note letting you know to read this and it relates to what's written up top. So the asterisk on the bottom states, the slave trade came through the cramped doorway of the slave ship, leaving a wake like that of a crawling desert caravan. It may be drawn like this. And he gives us this image here, right? The line with like the two points. And he says, um, Africans, African countries to the east, the lands of the Americas to the west. This creature is in the image of Fabril. African languages became deterritorialized, thus contributing to the creolization of the West. So this detour this deterritorialization of the African language, right? So I'm from Ghana. I speak Akan. I'm kidnapped. I'm put in the belly of the ship, and I'm transported to the Americas. So my African language of Akan is now deterritorialized out of Ghana and transported to the Western Hemisphere. I'm from Nigeria. I speak Igbo. I'm captured. I'm put into the bottom of the ship and transported to the Americas. My Igbo language has now, be, has now been deterritorialized and transferred to the Americas, right? Um, my Akan language, my Igbo language is now being mixed with English mixed with French, mixed with Spanish, and it's producing this new broken language that we call Creole, right? The Creolization of the West. This is the most completely known confrontation between the powers of the written word and the impulses of the orality. So orality is the ability to verbalize, to orate, right, to speak, to sing, to rap, to state poetry, to beatbox, right? Is verbal expression is this orality. The only written thing on a slave ship was the account book listing the exchange values of the enslaved. Within the ship's space, the cry of those deported was stifled. What does it mean to be stifled, to have something stifled? Stunted, right? Mm -hmm. Stopped, muted, um, limited, right? So that cry was stifled, okay? Um, as it would be, so he's talking about the cry, as it would be in the realm of the plantation, this confrontation still reverberates to this day. So there's a lot to unpack in this bottom portion of the text, right? One, he kind of gives you like, I know I'm being almost facetious by calling this a deportation, right? I, I know, I know. So I'm going to give you an asterisk. I'm going to tell you to meet me at the bottom of the page. And I'm letting you know, yeah, I know it, it, it's the slave trade, right? Like, I, I get it, right? Then he continues to say this notion of deterioration of African languages, which I described. Um, and then... He gets to these confrontations, and these confrontations, they, they become important, right? So the first confrontation is between the oral and the written, right? So the only thing written on the boat was what? He says it very clearly. The only thing written on the boat was what? The only thing uh, written, go ahead. The book listing of the exchange value of slaves. Right. So a ledger, right? And it's a receipt, right? Saying how much you paid for each individual, right? The only thing written symbolizes your inhumanity, right? The only thing written on this boat ensures you to be property, right? This is... The confrontation, one confrontation at play. So what's being written, which insinuates your inhumanity, U.S. property, versus the cries, the orality, right, that becomes stifled, stifled, right? So to cry, to laugh, right, to moan, to hum, to sing, those are all human emotions. There's all emanating human characteristics, right? So there's a confrontation at play between the human desire to orate 
and you being defined as property. Can I add a point to that real quick? Go ahead. About like the, because uh, I just thought about something right now, just not to click. Like, even though we all speak different languages from different places and all that, it's like very basic human understanding. Like, it don't matter what culture from, from you from, but if you're making a certain sound, we just know what you mean. So like, if you just like, if you moaning or groaning, we understand that you're upset. Or if you're crying, we understand that you're sad. Or if you're laughing, like every culture laughs. So we, I can we just like, even though I don't understand what you're saying, I can understand your emotions regardless. That's like a basic human like foundation. Hold on to that, because this is going to become very important as I move through the text. Hold on to that, because it's a very good point, right? So these confrontations at play. So that's the first confrontation, the written and the oral. The second confrontation is the stifling of those cries that will continue on the plantation, right? That's the second confrontation. And then the final confrontation, he says that it still reverberates to this day. So. The second confrontation was happening on the plantation, right? The desire to remain um, human by emitting these cries, but then the stifling of your human desire to force you to remain property, right? Then he says that continues still to this day. And what that could look like in our now, Black Lives Matter, nah, all lives matter, right? That's a stifling of the cry, right? To mute that cry out, to not give it its, its proper ownership. Um, and then he kind of moves into the three metamorphoses of the abyss. So the first abyss is the time that you fell in the belly of the boat, right? So when you're placed in that boat's belly, that's the first abyss. Um, and he continues to say, for in your poetic vision, a boat has no belly. A boat does not swallow up, does not devour. A boat is steered by the open skies, yet, the belly of this boat dissolves you, precipitates you into a non-world from which you cry out. This boat is a womb, a womb of the abyss. So the first abyss is the womb abyss, the open boat, okay? The next, ab the next abyss is the sea, the depths of the sea. And he goes on to say, whenever a fleet of ships gave chase to a slave ship, it was easiest to just lighten the, car lighten the boat by throwing cargo overboard weighing it down with balls and chains. These underwater signposts mark the course between the Gold Coast and the Leeward Islands. What is the cargo that's being thrown overboard that he's speaking of? African American, 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 African people. Yep, African people, right? That's why, um, so as we give chase, we dump the cargo or African individuals overboard to lighten the load so we could travel faster. What is not mentioned in here, though, are the Africans who chose to jump into the, uh, the second abyss opposed to being enslaved on the plantations of America. Some of them did this by choice. In fact, it was such a phenomenon of Africans jumping overboard that they begin to tie them to each other. So that way, if one jump, then they all jump or the weight of them being chained would not allow them to jump, right? This became such a phenomenon that they had to take provisions to prevent Africans from jumping overboard. Um, for those who seen Black Panther, it makes me think of uh, Michael B. Jordan's closing lines saying, well, you know, just throw me in the sea with my ancestors who'd rather be um, underwater than to be in prison, right? It's kind of the same premise. So that's the second abyss. But then he says that this center, the second of both, the second abyss creates underwater signposts from the Gold Coast to the Le Leeward Islands. So the Gold Coast is the west coast of Africa. The Leeward Islands are, are islands along the Western Hemisphere. But what are underwater signposts? What does that signify? weighing it down with balls and chains. These underwater signposts mark the course between the Gold Coast and the Leeward Island. So think about it, you on a, you on a 10 freeway, you're going west, right? You got what, um, Adams, Crenshaw, La Brea, Fairfax, right? Those signs will let you know your exit. So what Glissant is saying, the signs underneath the Atlantic Ocean 
are the Africans who were thrown overboard. And you can literally follow those signs and it will take you from the west coast of Africa to the western hemisphere, right? That's the second abyss. And then the third abyss is all that gets left behind in memory as you're transported from your old home to your new world, right? Um, the images, excuse me, the images of all that had been left behind, not being regained for generations. Feeling a language vanish, the words of the gods vanish, the sealed images of even the most everyday object vanishes, right? So that's the third abyss. Losing what you are accustomed to, losing the cultural nuances that make you you, right? And then for me, he kind of shifts the reading and he gives us the optimism of relations. He says that. The population that formed despite having forgotten the chasm, despite being unable to imagine the passion of those who founded there, who foundered there, nonetheless wove this sail. They did not use it to return to their former land, but to rise up in this unexpected, dumbfounded land, right? So there is a newness that gets formed through these relations, right? And through this newness, he says they wave a sail. And think about what a sail does on a ship, right? Essentially, is the engine that propels the, the ship. But they don't use that sail to return back to Africa, right? They use this sail to forge newness on this in this new land, okay? This is where he kind of gets to the um, the hope of this all. And he says that sale that is founded is knowledge, right? Not just a specific knowledge, but knowledge of the whole greater from having been at the abyss and freeing knowledge of relation within the whole, okay? So I'm gonna read that again, but I, I kind of chopped it up from my notes, but to give you guys a clear picture. He says, not just a specific knowledge, appetite, suffering, and delight, of one particular people, not only that, but knowledge of the whole, greater from having been at the abyss and freeing knowledge of relation within the whole. So think about this. Think about what he's painting out for us. When they went to the West Coast of Africa, they did not ask, yo, what's your ethnic background? They just snatched your ass up and put you on the bottom of that boat, right? So by and large, when you get to that boat, you have people from various different ethnic backgrounds, speaking various different ethnic languages, having various different ethnic cultures, customs, and traditions, right? So not a knowledge of, a, of one particular people, right? That's not what we're concerned with, right? Not, the, not just me as a Ghanaian from the Akan tradition, that's not the specified knowledge that I'm concerned with, but the knowledge of the whole, right? The whole greater from having been at the abyss, right? So there's a knowledge that's produced from being in this circumstance. So whether you speak Igbo, Hausa, Yorba, Akan, Tedenya, whatever the case may be, you have a shared knowledge because you've been in that abyss, right? This is what, what Mac was telling us earlier. When you moan, there's an understanding that takes place because I know what that moan comes from because I'm chained to you, right? There's a knowledge that's produced that when I shit, I got to shit on you because I'm chained to you. There's an understanding that gets produced from them circumstances, right? There's an understanding from seeing somebody from your different ethnic tribe that you may have been a rival with. But because of our circumstances, she's giving birth in the belly of this ship. And you understand that pain because you're witnessing it because of the abyss, right? So knowledge of the whole is what Gleason is getting us to think about. Um... Then he says, for though this experience made you original victim floating towards the sea's abyss, an exception, it became something shared and made us, the descendants, one people among others, right? Again, so it's the shift from me as an individual to the whole that the abyss is creating, right? 
um, made us, the descendants among other people. Peoples do not live on exception. Relation is not made up of things that are foreign, but of shared knowledge. This experience of the abyss can now be said to be the best element of exchange. So if relation is not about what separates us, but what makes us the same, then he says the abyss, it becomes the most generative element for understanding our sameness. This is where the abyss shifts, shapes, ship shapes into something positive, okay? And then he says that this is why we stay with poetry, right? Because poetry allows us to do the work of producing new. Poetry, what does poetry do, right? It manipulates, it plays with language, right? It takes something old and makes something new out of it. And he says, for us, for African people, for those who have been through the abyss, this ability to be poetic, to make new is important, right? And we're not gonna focus on the things that separate us to produce this newness. We're gonna focus on the things that make us the same. And what Glissant is attentive to is this abyss as the source of our sameness. Okay, so I'm gonna, question. yeah, go for it. Would you say that that applies also to even like modern, um... African poetry and like even African inspired. Absolutely. Uh, to me, uh, like I look at music, right? A lot. Um, so jazz to me is a byproduct of what he's talking about. Um, in a more contemporary sense, if you guys listen to, if you guys come early and kind of like listen to the music that's played, not today particularly, but just as a whole, I play a lot of what they call Afrobeat music, right? And it's specifically from the West Coast of Africa but it's a perfect depiction of not only relation, but this notion of Pan-Africanism. Because if you listen to it, you hear the African rhythms, right? You hear the Caribbean or the Jamaican linguistics, and then you hear hip hop, right? You hear them rapping. So it's a mashup of all these cultural influences to produce a music genre called Afrobeat. So you're, you're absolutely right, Rohan. Um, before we transition into our fishbowl, are there any questions about anything that was discussed? So keep in mind, this reading was dense. It was opaque. I'm not expecting you to be an expert of what you're talking about in your fishbowl. I'm just asking you to talk about something that you found of interest or a question that you may have. Um, if you went twice already, you're good. If you went once, you have one more chance and you only have one time to pass. Um, who wants to volunteer to be for the fishbowl tonight? Is that you volunteering tonight? You put something in the chat. I don't know what that is. Sorry. Sorry. I, I had adjusted and it messed up now. Okay. No worries. Um, is there any volunteers for the fishbowl? All right. So I'm going to just call at random. I'll volunteer. I'm sorry. Who is that? Oh, it's CJ. Sorry CJ. about that. Thank you. All right. No, thank, thank you. No worries. Um, anyone else? All right, uh, Brianna, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, I fishbowl like three times. Oh, okay, well, you're good. No worries. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, Taylor, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Yeah, I can. Okay, thank you. Um, let's get two more people. Uh, David, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Can I take the pass today? Yeah, absolutely. Um, Grisella, are, are you, Grisella, excuse me, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Um, no, I'm not prepared today. Uh, Ricardo, are you prepared to fishbowl today? Okay. Okay. Thank you, Ricardo. Actually, we'll just do three. That's cool. Um, so we have CJ, Taylor, and Ricardo for our fishbowl today. Whoever wants to set it off is on you. I'll go first. Okay. Um, I thought it was really interesting when he said, this boat pregnant with as many dead as living under sentence of death. Mm -hmm. Like, that just, like, it took me a while to, like, actually interpret, like, what it meant, you know, because, like, 
the people that were like alive, they weren't really like alive, you know? Like they were on the boat, like breathing, but they weren't like like living a life, you know what I mean? Sentenced to death, absolutely. Yeah, it was. Um I had a question on where is it? I forgot where it was. One second. Sure. No rush. Um, when it says experience of the abyss lies inside and outside the abyss, I didn't really know what that meant. Yeah. What um what page is that? Because I think we have to read a little bit more to get the full seven. Seven. Okay, so I'm, I'm gonna read the first half of that paragraph and then we'll unpack that, okay? So he says that the experience, the experience of the abyss lies inside and outside the abyss. The torment of those who never escaped it straight from the belly of the slave ship into the violent belly of the ocean depths they went. So remember how I talked about um, those who chose to jump over the ship or those who were thrown off the ship, right? So. He's saying that you you can't escape it, right? So even um, if you move, so the first abyss is the boat itself, right? So you want to move outside of that abyss and you get outside of that boat by jumping over board, right? So outside of that first abyss, but you're just jumping into another abyss by going into the water, right? So there, that's the inside outside of the abyss that you really can't escape. Another way to think about the inside outside of the abyss, right? The first abyss we know is the boat. Let's just say that you are able to survive that whole transition and you're brought to the Americas, right? So that first abyss, you have become outside of that now, but now you're going into the abyss of the plantation, which is a whole nother abyss within itself. So that's the inside outside of the abyss that he's mentioning. Like even your desire to get you outside of the abyss oftentimes puts you into another abyss, a la going from the slave ship to the actual ocean. Does that make sense, Taylor? Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Okay. And that's why he says it's followed up with the, the torment of those who never escaped it, straight from the belly of the slave ship into the violent belly of the ocean depths they went. Yeah. yeah. Overall, I was just really, really, like, in awe of, like, the imagery and the, like, deep description of the text because it's, like, you always kind of like in school, you just kind of hear, yeah, like they were just taken over and and it was really sad and people died, you know what I mean? But like reading this is like a more like in-depth, like not interpretation, but like description of like the people and, you know, the not trip, but <laughs> right. I don't know how else to say it. And I just to um, piggyback on that, Taylor, because it, it's a um, it's in the fact that you're attentive to that is interesting. Because when I was putting the class together, I'm thinking like, okay, we can't talk about a genealogy of the African experiences without dealing with the system of enslavement. And it's like, how do we want to go about that? And one thing I didn't want to do was tell the same old story that has been told over and over again. And I thought that Glissant does a very effective way of articulating this experience that is far from what we're used to, but it has an affective, with an A, not an E, an effective, visceral experience when you read it. It kind of puts you into the shoes, if you will, of those who are being placed in the, body, the belly of that boat. Exactly. It's like, you know, you like see like drawings and stuff like that and those little like like books and you spend like that one chapter in class like just like reading and learning about it but like really getting into the depths and like the deep description and like having to really like pull apart the words and fully think about like all the experiences was really interesting to me yeah absolutely and eye-opening not only interesting yeah yeah good call out thank you Yeah, uh, CJ or Ricardo, whichever uh, I'll go. Okay. So I'm gonna be honest. I was like, when uh, going into this class, I was a little like uneducated on the subject, like on the uneducated side, I guess. So when I was reading this, I'm gonna compare it to like something I know very well, which is like Night by Eli Wiesel. And I remember when I was reading that book, I would feel my heart in my stomach. So while reading this, 
it kind of brought that feeling back and it you just kind of obviously you're not going to feel anything near what these people felt um <laughs> but I kind of felt you know sadness and kind of heartbreak to see like or to read how people were put through this pain like human beings were put through this pain just because their skin color and everything and it was <laughs> I actually had the same uh, interpretation from the paragraph on on page seven, mm-hmm. which is um, their ideal did not die. It quickened into this continuous, discontinuous thing: the panic of the new land, the haunting of the former land, and basically being and <laughs> basically um, the poor people. They were like taken from one place where it wasn't necessarily the best, but it was home, to being taken to the ocean, which is essentially inescapable. So it's just really sad to see how their lives were determined for them rather than them being able to live their own life. Why do you say she did, um, why do you say that it's not necessarily, not necessarily the best place where they're taken from? So for me, what I kind of know from school, I was probably like, I was probably like not taught properly because I take it from like, you know, eighth grade history and everything when we talk about slavery and stuff where originally I remember being taught that slavery wasn't as bad as I have read Mm -hmm. um, now, like as a mature person. (laughs) But I remember reading like, like back in eighth grade, like, oh, slaves, they were happy with their lives being slaves and stuff and that they were treated well. And then reading more into it and looking (laughs) more into the subject, it's like, that's not true at all. So I remember kind of being told that Africa their homeland and everything was not as modern as the new America was right. but I don't mean to offend I'm so sorry no, no, no. I, I, I asked I kind of knew what you meant but I asked for you to give exactly what you stated right and, and I think what you did and not to be embarrassed but it's a great teaching moment because and you articulated it keenly right this is what I've been taught and to be honest with you CJ I was taught the same shit literally in my fourth and fifth grade history or social science books, they had pictures of the enslaved smiling. Like they had smiles on their face. And we were taught the same trope that it was happy. It was better for them than what they were coming from, right? And it's so pervasive that you would hear even Africans in America say the same shit, right? Like, oh, well, at least I wasn't in Africa, right? So it's the same thing. But I, I do also bring this up to, Yes, we got information from um, our upbringing in, in K through 12, but also we have seven weeks of information as well, right? And if you think about the readings on my eye, if you think about the readings of Patahotep, you think about how Maladoma articulates his culture, right? We know that there was things going on in Africa that were far more advanced from a spiritual level, from a philosophical level, right? From a level of how people interact that were far more advanced than what was going on in the West, right? So I just wanna bring this up as a moment to say, now we have information to counter the narrative that has been imbued into us that says that Africa is A, B, and C, right? We have now some information from Africans themselves that can counter that narrative, right? So thank you one, CJ, for being vulnerable enough to kind of articulate what we all experienced you know, um, and, and really, this is why I asked you the question I asked. So thank you for that. Um, last up, Ricardo. So for me, the whole thing seems to be about the fear of the unknown. If you look at the bottom of page eight, yep. it says, for us and without exception, and no matter how much distance we may keep, the abyss is also a projection yep. of and a perspective into the unknown. Yep. So that's what made me relate the whole thing to like kind of being scared of of the outcome, like they had to make a decision whether to stay on the boat or jump off and they don't know the outcome of their decision. So the whole thing is just making a decision without knowing. Or having decisions made for you also without knowing. But yeah, that's a, that's a really, really great call out, Ricardo. The abyss is the unknown. And if yeah. you think about how it metamorphosizes itself, each element is an element of the unknown, as you perfectly articulated. So that's a really good call out, Ricardo. Thank you. Um, 
So thank you guys for those who fishbowl. It was a really good fishbowl. You guys brought some really good points. Um, let's transition into our group conversation. Tonight, why don't you speak on what you put in the text? Um, I was just saying, I think to add on to CJ, how when I was growing up, obviously I knew like there has to be some form of wealth, some form of well living in Africa. It can't all just be poverty. It never made sense to me growing up that how was this entire, you know, area of land, just everyone, everyone is living in poverty. So, but I remember growing up, I will always see those commercials in the middle of my cartoon saying, uh, if you just donate 10 cents, we'll be able to feed these entire villages. And they always show the, the kids walking to water reserves and they're having to walk miles without shoes and they never showed roads yeah. or houses it was always huts it was always being surrounded and having to live off the land having to eat bugs and having to not saying that that doesn't happen but they never showed areas where it was people in houses and streets and skyscraper buildings so that was that was you know, the frustrating part, I guess, growing up. And here, here's a trick bag also. Like, you can show the same images of how they depict Africa of America. We have one of the right. worst homeless and poverty rates in the world, right? You can go downtown and, and show some images of downtown, and it looks worse than a third world country. So it's all about propaganda and how these things are presented to us. Um, one thing I do want to kind of touch on to help you guys hopefully understand this text a little bit more. This notion of creolization, um, he has another chapter in this book entitled Creol Creolization. And I think this is a great way to think about not only the Western world, um, but more specifically African and indigenous people's experiences, right? Um, is anybody familiar with Creole culture, um, Louisiana, the Caribbean, anything like that? Anybody got family roots or, or been down to New Orleans? Okay. Um, anybody familiar with the dish entitled gumbo? T tonight, can you explain to the class how um, gumbo is is prepared? If if you know, um, there's two. There's gumbo, and there's the there's another one that sounds very similar to it. Um, well, it's been a while since I've actually had some, but it's kind of like. I guess the best way to describe it is if you're thinking of like a seafood boil, but a soup. Yep. It's a, it has the rice. It also does have the crab, the shrimp, but there's potatoes, there's rice, sometimes corn, there's sausage. Um, it's, it's like a soup. It's like a seafood soup almost. So when preparing gumbo, right, the, probably the most important thing is the broth or the root. Right, so it's it's like um, chicken broth. I would I would use vegetable broth. Um, they have seafood broth, right? And when you prepare the broth, the first thing you do if you're doing it right is you're gonna put the seasonings in there, right? And you'll let that season kind of simmer for maybe 30, 20 minutes, kind of allow that to kind of melt and infuse itself into the broth. And then as tonight point out, you know, you'll get your sausage. If you're into chicken, you'll get your chicken. You'll get your rice, crab legs, shrimps, um, okra, um, whatever, you know what I'm saying, moves you. Some Old Bay, season it up. And you allow that to sit and simmer for an hour, right? And, and that simmering becomes important. That time becomes important because it allows the flavors to merge, right? So if you think about African people's experience, if you think about indigenous people's experience, if you think about Caribbean culture, gumbo was a perfect metaphor for that, right? You have African peoples from West Africa, from Ghana, from Senegal, from Nigeria, right? Um, speaking a vari variety of languages, right? And they're placed in this boat and they are forced to communicate with each other. So they come up with their own broken form of language, right? Then they get off this boat, and if they're placed in the Americas, majority of the people speak English. So now they're trying to interpret English and make a language or a form of communication with that, coupled with the broken language that they formed on that boat, right? So that produces a whole new language that we'll call broken English, that we'll call Ebonics, that will go on to evolve into African-American vernacular, right? Um, some Africans are brought to the Caribbean, 
right? And depending on what island they're placed on, they may speak French. So it's the broken African languages that can that are conf, um, conflated on the boat, mixed with the French language of their oppressor, and they're trying to establish a form of communication. And if you're in Jamaica, it may be developed into what we call patois, right? Um, if you're in Haiti, it will inform in, in, in form into this Creole language that, that is specified to Haiti, right? You'll take your African customs of cooking that you know from back home, and you may not have the same spices, the same vegetables that you have in Africa, but you'll use the closest thing to it, and you'll make your dishes, right? So it's the mixture of all these different things that come together to produce what is. And for Glissant, that's relations. The way that things can come in together, right, over time and produce something new, uh, or like a dish we call gumbo, right? This is what Glissant is concerned with. Again, it's not what makes us different. It's the shared experience, the shared knowledge that becomes important for producing this notion or this idea of relation or how we can relate and communicate and interact with one another, right? Again, you see this in music. You see this in art. You see this in the variety of ways that people of culture express themselves through their dress, through they, the festivals that they have, right? This is all a byproduct of this notion of relation. Um, let's get two more comments to close this out before we call it a day. Preferably from somebody we have not heard from. Jaden, you've been quiet today, bro. How are you, you feeling? What you thinking? Honestly, it's a lot to take in, uh, really, um, to be honest. And I think that's why I've been really staying quiet, more so because, like, I want to be able to take it all in and give, like, a more informed response, you know? Yeah, yeah. That, that um, intellectual contemplation is important. What I would suggest, though, um, when you have some time, reread this. And see, now that you've gotten the notes to give you a little deeper understanding, see what kind of comes off the pages this time around, now that you've um, gotten some notes to kind of partner with your understanding of, of the reading. But yeah, it, I, I did this on purpose, right, to get you guys to kind of struggle with something. Um, and, and also, as thinkers, as intellectuals, right, we don't have to stick to these standard essays, right? There's a variety of ways to express our written thoughts on paper and a poetic is one of my favorite ways of producing because again the use of metaphor the use of manipulation of language to me becomes very helpful when articulating our experiences as marginalized people right um thinking back to um maladoma patrice omey and the violence that ensues when translation takes place right thinking about um in googie's tension between the english language and his native language. But these, when you think about relation from the Gleesanton standpoint, it becomes, po poetry becomes a whole new language unto itself. A language that's not restricted by either English or African languages or indigenous languages, right? It has the freedom and the liberty to, to pull from all. Um, Emiliano, what are your thoughts on, the, on today's conversation or reading? Kind of overwhelming because while well, I'm as well like not really informed on this topic, well, I wasn't informed from what I learned, mm -hmm. but I could kind of relate to like their feelings because um when I said like the whole deportation thing, mm -hmm. it just brought like bad bad memories for me because like while well, my dad was facing like the whole deportation thing too, and I just remembered like being in the court like courtroom, it was like an abyss as well for me. Like mm -hmm. I just saw like. I couldn't like climb out and then like when uh this is just hard for me to talk about it but like when they were giving the final decision it was just like uh it was like the longest like seconds of my life like just waiting for them to decide whether you know yeah but thankfully like everything was good and yeah yeah you know Emiliano um thank you for that man because that's why I say it's important for you guys to share because I, I, I really learned something here. So for me, initially, I was thinking about this like Tanaya, like deportation, bro. that's a, a hella polite way to put what happened to us, right? But 
when you hear what Emiliano just articulated, that kind of shifts the way, it doesn't make this, this term deportation as light as I initially interpreted it. Does that make sense? Like what you're saying, Emiliano, it, it, it speaks to the trauma, the tragedy, and the pain and violence that goes into deportation. So, yeah. it, and it's really not a light term at all, right? Like really, it's an accurate term. And when you think about it from Emiliano's context, it really doesn't need an asterisk. Just that, uh, that word alone is sufficient to capture the pain that goes along with deportation. So not, I, and I say this sincerely, Emiliano, um, thank you because you taught me something. Um, you gave me another lens of interpretation for the text. And, and more importantly, I thank you for just being open and vulnerable with the class about your experiences. Um, let's get one more. Gisela, can you close this out? What are your thoughts on today's conversation or the reading? Yes, I can. Um, what was what do you want me to close off with again? Just uh, think about the reading or what we talked about today. Well, the reading, I was just seeing how much like pain and not vulnerability, but pain and torture that like took place and everything, how they said. It was one third of them could even fit in there inside of the small boat. And it's just crazy to think of how they didn't see them as human beings, more as just property. It breaks my heart because, well, my family, they're from um, an island, like in Panama. Okay. So, but like, um, I guess like it was something with the slave owners because my last name's Archibald but like half of my family is black so it's just crazy to see what we're like like how much torture and pain they endured and it just um I don't know I I don't really have words for it because it just breaks my heart but it's something that no one it's it's a part of history but it's just terrible to even think about yeah yeah but I think <laughs> And not to say that what I'm going to say absolves the atrocity to what it is, but I think it's an interesting to what way to look at what happened in the sense of because of this, we have all this newness, right? Because of this, we have dance hall culture. Because of this, we have Caribbean food. Because of this, we have Creole culture. And again, I'm not, not saying as a justification, but from a point of intellectual research and intellectual work, that becomes a, a fecund place of investigation. Right. It's an interesting way to take um, lemons and turn them into lemonade, if you will. Right. It's an interesting way of taking the scraps off of uh, the slave owner's table and producing soul food. Right. And I, I think that's really what Glissant is trying to get us to be attentive to through this text. Yeah, it brought like something catastrophic, catastrophic, I think mm -hmm. that's the word, to something not beautiful, but a new sense of life and culture. And it can be beautiful. Cause, cause I mean, if you go to the Caribbean, that culture is beautiful, right? Like you see the, the festivals and the way that they could produce music and things, it's beauty there. The art that's produced is beautiful. So it can be beautiful. Tanaya? Something that, uh, that you just brought up uh, when we were talking about the soul food, I just had this discussion with my coworker the other day because he was telling me about, um, we were talking about stones and the meaning behind different types of stones and how when people involve themselves in things that they don't know and understand, that's when bad things happen. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of got into the different cultures and like the culture of Europeans and then the culture of Africans and how Europeans were civilized by Africans and it just, one thing that it definitely like made me think about was a lot of our food is similar, but it seems like because we civilize them, obviously our dishes are the original dishes and theirs are, you know, them trying to be unique in an already established dish. So it just, I don't know, it, yeah. it makes sense as to why with some things, it's kind of like, where, like, you know, where did this come from? Like, why? does it lack certain ingredients? But I think that lack of ingredients is more so, well, we're trying to be different. We're trying to be unique 
And in that being unique, it kind of messes up some of, you know. Yeah, it's the integrity but, of the dish. Right. Yeah, yeah. So that, that, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah, that's very true. Good call out. Um, so let me point out to you guys your reading for next week. So we're already in week eight. So shit, this is moving quickly. Um, we're going into Zornel Hurston's of Mules and Men. So one thing with this text, it's not a hard read. It's not hard to understand. It's not like Glissant, but the language is difficult. So think about what I was saying far as, you know, it's a, a, a variety of African dialectics on this boat. You get off the boat and now you're introduced to this English language and you're trying to make a means of communication, right? So in doing so, you might produce a paragraph that looks like y'all been telling and lying about all these varmints, but you ain't yet spoke about the high chief boss, all the world, which is the lion. So I, I'm reading that to show you that this is written in a way that is very broken English. And it will be helpful for you guys when reading this is to read it out loud because to hear what she's writing will make it make more sense than trying to just say it in your head. So I, I suggest that you read it out loud, um, take some time with it and, and you know, uh, struggle through the linguistics of it. But the reading itself is not too difficult. Um, if you guys have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Um, 